Welcome to the Art of Marketing Operations, a Taylor podcast. Here you can grow your knowledge about marketing operations, listen to ideas and strategies to help you scale, grow, and optimize your efficiency, drive your speed to market, and enrich your work life. Let's get to it. Welcome to the Art of Marketing Operations, a Taylor podcast. I'm Glenn Bottomley, and today my guest is Lauren Texera, Senior Manager of Demand Generation at HighSpot, the world's number one sales enablement platform with more than 8 million users connected. Thanks for joining me today, Lauren. Thank you for having me. Well, Lauren, you have been in the marketing discipline for more than 10 years now, and I know that you've specifically focused on, you know, lead generation, uh, marketing operations in your background, account-based marketing, et cetera, p- particularly in the last seven years. So what would you describe as the common thread that you've seen that ties through lead gen, marketing operations and ABM, all of those? Yep, definitely. I would say that, you know, data is definitely the key to a lot of that um, in different ways, but key in measurement of what's working, what's not across those. And I think, you know, with lead gen, you have more of like data with your segmentation across different channels, what will help drive quality leads, to deliver your sales team and to provide them the right messaging and content in that segmentation, depending on what stage they're at. I think for marketing ops, you know, you want to make sure you have clean data, um, attribution tracking is accurate, reporting is streamlined across the funnel and across each um, marketing function. You know, biggest thing is like marketing ops supports every function across marketing, demand generation, partner marketing, customer marketing, um, product marketing. And so they want to ensure that everyone is looking at the data the same way, whether it's like MQLs, SQLs, pipeline source, pipeline influence, that kind of um, metrics. And then lastly is like for ABM, I would say like, once again, you know, your segmentation, your account list is really key of aligning with like sales on that account list by using your firmographic data, your engagement data, such as, you know, marketing engagement and intent and and any other like relevant data that will help you prioritize and focus your marketing sales efforts on those high value accounts that are ultimately your ideal customer profile and hopefully in market to buy. Mm, nice. That's a that's a great way to kick off. Now, let's flip that question around, though. And conversely now, so what have you found to be sort of the most important or prominent differences between, you know, lead gen, marketing operations and ABM? So obviously, if data is the thread that ties it all together, um, what are some of the key differences in terms of how you look at those uh, three uh, different functions? Yeah, definitely. I think um, for marketing operations, you know, you are definitely more process focused, you know, you more of like streamlining things across the board with lead generation. Um, I would say, and even ABM is like, you know, getting a little bit more creative out of the box, um, a little bit more closer to um, your content team and your comms team. So you're making sure, you know, your messaging is up, is streamlined across the different stages of the funnel. Um, you know, you're working closely with design with lead gen aspect and making sure, you know, that your ads are appealing, you know, <laughs> different things like that. And then with ABM um, would be like kind of a good, good mix in the sense of like process and creativity. Um, ABM, you layer in more of like the field event aspect and you're working very close with, you know, your field team and your events team to create more one-to-one experiences to those um, accounts you're trying to target. Mm, Great, uh, great distinctions there. Thank you. Now, when you and I chatted before, one of the things that I know that you had mentioned that you recently had really enhanced uh, the overall marketing operations, uh, and particularly over the last several years, has really been the introduction of lead scoring. And uh, and I know that that was uh, sort of in response to some challenges that you were having in the in the marketing operations team, uh, where you were sending some unqualified leads over to sales. But then after you had uh, you know I- implemented lead scoring, then you were able to deliver much higher quality leads to sales. So in other words, quality over quantity. So can you first start with? a description from your perspective. Okay, what is lead scoring? But then spend some time, like how you've actually implemented it, 
like the pitfalls that you ran into? Like, how do you know it's actually generating value, et cetera? Let's dig in on lead scoring. Definitely. So, um, Lead scoring for me is like a way to qualify leads based on who they are and how they're engaging with our company and brand. So um, this will allow us to kind of automatically rank and prioritize leads that we deliver sales or in, like our sales team that gets us kind of aligned and it gets us to um, deliver these leads for them to easier um, communicate with them and drive ultimately drive business. So um, really for when we run into the the lead scoring issue that I found here was that, you know, I came on and our lead score um, MQL to SAL conversion rate was at like 50%, which is to me very low industry standard from what I've experienced in the past. So um, what I did was first is like how to drive awareness internally of this issue and how then we can kind of go into um, categorizing these different leads and we started focusing on okay here's the conversion rates across the funnel and like here's our goal with the new conversion rates and what we want to get to so you know with updating our lead scoring by focusing on the firmographic data that we want of our like ICP and the different engagement levels with like you know downloaded piece of content attended event those things and ranking those to then deliver these high quality leads we've increase that to upwards of like 80 to 85%. So with that, the main pitfalls that I've, I've redone lead scoring probably three or four times. Um, the main pitfalls that I've come across is really how, um, you know, who should be involved in that initial process. And I think if you don't have that sales alignment and like how they're actually, you know, outbounding sales to leads and like who they're targeting and then aligning with how you're grading those leads, then it won't work out. So getting them on board and getting them to understand what is lead scoring, what's the importance of it and why these leads are important and like having them trust you on that and actually seeing that value of the conversion all the way through is key. Mm, yeah, so that alignment to sales in common definitions, uh, I think is that I very much would agree with you there. I think that that's key. Um, and I, and I know that, uh, I know that you, uh, have had really good success working closely with sales BDR teams on things like, you know, customer cadences and, you know, journeys, pitch templates, messaging, et cetera. So what have been some of the, the key ways that you found to effectively build out things like customer cadences and journeys? Yes, definitely. Um, I think, in those aspects, you know, the content team and the enablement team have been the key players with this. Um, I start off working with our head of content by like outlining what content to put in these cadences and really aligning with our quarterly theme. So each each year for planning, we have quarterly themes that we have for marketing and, you know, how do we get sales on board with these quarterly themes by providing, you know, cadences that show by persona the pain points at each stage of the journey. So. Um, after we create these cadences per persona and all these different eight to 10 touch points, we, um, I work with our enablement team who is kind of like our liaison between sales and marketing to ensure, you know, my content email templates that we've created not aren't any like marketing. -y. Um, and we've turned them into more of like sales focused langu language. Cause obviously, you know, they're more the experts of like how we should be talking to say how we should be talking to buyers. And so, um, you know, they're helping with how to kind of make this more into how ADRs would actually use them with across to different personas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then how do you, or, or, or is there any, uh, either specific software or tools that you've used over the years, mm -hmm. uh, that can, can help create those? Yeah. So as of right now, we do do that in high spot and we use sales plays, but we are um, eventually looking into a sales game engagement platform currently, like a group of a sales loft or an outreach, um, which we're in the process of purchasing. And then we'll be moving those over into there that will help us better, you know, analyze how successful these cadences are doing. Gotcha. Excellent. Um, now here's something that's interesting. Uh, when we chatted earlier, um, you had mentioned that in the past, um, you know, some coworkers, uh, would describe what you and in a marketing operations team would do was quote, paid media top of funnel. But then I loved something that you shared with me and you said, but you would always correct them by saying that you and your team were actually paid media full funnel. 
And so that's it's a it's an important distinction. So can you just unpack that a little yeah, bit more? <laughs> definitely. I think that traditionally I feel like demand gen has been more focused on like lead generation and acquisition and like, you know, our job is to provide leads to sales and then their jobs to push them to get deals. But I think we moved into more of a role of how we support sales across the whole funnel through paid and through other channels, but you know, paid is just an aspect of it. And, you know, really focusing on targeting different personas at these different stages and of the buyer's journey across these paid channels. So I think the ultimate goal is really to provide the right messages at the right time that will really help us increase these conversion rates. And, you know, if that's accelerating pipeline, if that's accelerating um, net new pipeline, accelerating deals, like no matter what it is, our goal is to align our messaging with what sales is saying and then to try to target them across different platforms. Mm -hmm. And then I would imagine that by shifting this perception uh, and broadening it, not only I would imagine is good for for the marketing team, obviously, uh, it certainly helps the relationship with sales. But have you found that it has also helped you, uh, you know, uh, in other functional areas organizationally or culturally within the organization? Yes, definitely. I think we've gotten closer to product marketing even within marketing. I mean, you know, there's so many marketing functions. Um, product marketing in the sense of aligning, you know, our themes that are top of funnel themes all the way through to how it relates to actually more of like bottom of the funnel when you get into like consideration decision and making sure that, you know, our content kind of has the same consistent messaging, consistent branding all the way through. And so we want to just make sure we're providing those, you know, consistent personalized brand experiences from top to bottom and even when they become customers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And does that, uh, does the, uh, with the broadening view of full funnel, clearly I would think, correct me if I'm wrong here, but clearly I would think that, that this would impact your, you know, creative, it would impact your messaging, content strategies, et cetera. It, it's, it, but by shifting it where it's like, we're not just top of funnel, it's the entire funnel. I, I would think every aspect of marketing operations and the deployment of it gets impacted. Yeah. Oh yes, definitely. I think, I think the heaviest one is obviously Design is the biggest resource, like the most spread thin resource for us specifically because of that. And because, you know, testing and optimizing and like you're always wanting to try different design and stand out from the rest because that's really what we're trying to do across these paid channels. So I think definitely design wise and then content team um, learnings from that, sharing those learnings and making sure that everyone knows what, what worked, what hasn't, is also something that we've been trying more and more to do so that even sharing them to our enablement team to say, hey, this worked well on paid, you know, we should update some of the messaging we have in our pitch templates for emails to align with that because it, you know, it's targeting this stage of the funnel. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, okay. Now let's uh, shift gears here. So um, when we chatted before, I, one of the things that I, I asked you was like, what absolutely is a passion of yours uh, related to marketing operations? And I loved how you phrased it. You said that a passion of yours is the importance of delivering customized customer experiences and using the full life cycle of data to do that. I love that sentence. There is so much to unpack in that. So I want to break it down. So let's first start with defining what we mean by a customer experience. So first, define for us in your mind, what is the customer experience and the customer journey, uh, you know, in sort of the, the differences with them that you've seen throughout your various jobs? Yeah, definitely. So um, I think customer experience starts from when a prospective customer first becomes aware or engages with your company or brand, whether it be, you know, a website on your website, at an event, sees a paid ad. Um, and then it continues, honestly, all the way until they become a customer. And I even think the customer experience doesn't end because even when they become a customer, you know, there's so much opportunity with adoption, expansion, and making sure your customer's happy and, like, customers really fuel your business and will always fill your business. So I think, you know, just starting from beginning all the way through and then as they continue to be a customer, it really never ends. There's always some sort of personalized experience you want to give your customers. 
Mm -hmm. Well, and that's a that's a good segue. So from the customer experience, then now let's talk about the customized uh, customer experience. So, so can you explain um, what the customized customer experience is? How do you maybe uh, you know not get uh, you know spooky or creepy with that? You know, for uh, for, yeah. for the customer, right? Uh, you know, in the various ways that you have found that has been successful, you know, in your mm-hmm. career, uh, of how you appropriately customize. Uh, that customer experience for, you know, for the customers. Yeah, I definitely think obviously getting too spooky is something you want to avoid. But um, I think delivering (laughs) these like more personalized messaging and and offerings to a customer across the buying cycle um, obviously depends on, you know, what's your company's strategic goals. So really aligning with the overall strategic goals. And um, for example, my previous company, we focused on, you know, top four verticals. You know, we had retail e-commerce, media and entertainment, travel and financial services. And within those, we identify, you know, what accounts were that we want to target within these verticals. And then we really created more of like a strategy across all these, an integrated strategy across all these channels and across the funnel that focused on these verticals. This is just simple changes of like changing messaging, changing, you know, updating your current content with new titles and new, you know, new intros, just small changes that will really hit those like counts pain points and use cases so that, you know, you're aligning this across the board. Um, within this, you know, I think definitely different channels you do this with, um, explored website personalization a lot in the last few years in the sense of targeting these verticals and having when they come to your website and testing, is that making a bigger impact and so forth? Um, and so we've, you know, depending on the vertical and, and each company I've been at, it has changed. It's never like a hundred percent. This is what you have, like you should be doing to financial services. It, it's always an ever evolving. How do we make this customer experience better and more personalized across all of these channels? Mm-hmm. It, it reminds me of uh, a, a data set that I remembered uh, from years ago. Uh, it was maybe about four, three to four years ago. And it was in the context of email, not web personalization, uh, you know, from a, an experience online. But it was related to outreach from sales. And the research showed that uh, if a message is personalized, from 0% of the message personalized to up to 30% of the message is personalized, each percentage point, you actually gain lift in the mind of the customer or the buyer. So from zero to 30. So that's good if you customize a little bit uh, of the message. From 30% to 80%, you really get no more lift from that 30 to 80%. And again, this is in an email context from sales. Uh, And then once you go 80% customized, the message is 80% customized or greater, you actually get a um, diminishing return. It actually, you know, border, it moves into that area of spooky or, or creepy because, and and I actually had this happen to me with um, an email that I received. This was uh, from a, uh, uh, a, uh, a sales representative at a company and uh, they had researched me on LinkedIn. They, they, like called the company that I worked for. They, I mean, it, it just was crazy. And they included so much information uh, about me that it was like so far beyond the 80%. And of course they were probably thinking they were being super clever and, you know, trying to really engage with me as, you know, as a buyer and so forth, but it just, it went so far. So, so now if we transfer that to a web context, uh, How much personalization, like, does that, is it your experience that that percentage holds that, you know, you want enough personalization, but, you know, not too much? What's, what's been your experience? I I think that like, there's more of enough personalization, the sense of delivering what they're looking, trying to deliver what they're trying to find on your site quicker. So like the whole point is obviously to get them to a demo, right? Like when they come to your site, we want to get them to a demo or when they're past that phase, we want to show them product information and get them to be a customer and so forth. So I think it's figuring out, you know, how to not be explicitly like, 
hey, I know you do this X, Y, Z, and like very, yeah. very. Which you, which you, which you, which you, which you wouldn't know in the yeah, beginning. Yeah, you wouldn't know in the beginning, visitor, but you could. Or, or, I mean, technically, with the information out there, you could probably get. I think there is a good happy medium with personalization and not being too too creepy and spooky too, on that. Creepy, yeah, because yeah, you may you may know domain mm-hmm. or you may know you know some information or if they of course. If they've left an email address yep. or something, you know, you may have a, some indication, uh, you know, in terms of returning visits and so forth. So, yeah, it's 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 a it's a it's a good insight and just a good reminder about um, that. You know, you want enough, uh, but not too yeah. much. It's, it's yeah. sort of the, the goal. I think it's the same uh, with sort of brands, sort of. right? Like when 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 brands give me really good experiences across the web and across mobile, I enjoy it. So I don't mind getting ads from brands that. I like and that I'm like, oh, this is really geared towards me. I, but some people don't. So I also think there's more of like a personal preference aspect (laughs) in the sense Mm -hmm. of like what people like or don't like. Yeah. Yeah. There's, uh, the, um, uh, the Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Dr. Shoshana Zuboff uh, from Harvard University. It's an incredible book, but it, it gets into exactly what you're talking about, which is, you know, a lot of people just don't want uh, to be followed on the web. They don't want, you know, their data to be sold. They don't want, etc. cetera. Um, and so f- to your per- perspective, that's that's going so far in one direction where like that. And yet I have, uh, there's a friend of mine that I, that I, that I know who is exactly as you just stated. They're like, I want to receive personalized ads. I, you know, retarget me all the time, you know, all you want. I, I want a better experience. And so for them, it's just absolutely no, in, no issue whatsoever. So it's fascinating. Um, okay. So we've talked about then customer experience. We've talked about customizing the customer experience. Now let's talk about when you mentioned the full life cycle of data and being able to do that. So can you expand on some of the best ways that you've used data in your career um, across the full life cycle of the buyer's journey to sort of maximize the ability of the of that customer experience? Yeah, definitely. I think data is, is key for that personalization experience because if you have bad data and then you're targeting, you're personalizing something to someone who's in retail and financial services, they're automatically going to be like, wait, what? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I think clean data, account and personal level data on your CRM, like, which is huge, obviously for operations and then making sure, you know, you have, um, the different fields within your database that are across the buyer's journey that they've engaged with. So like what stage they're at in those things. And for previous experiences, um, you know, I mentioned the vertical stuff, you know, we've done that across the funnel. I think customers is also very interesting. Once they become a customer, you get a lot of data um, in the sense of product usage and those things, what products they're using, what products they're not, what opportunity there is there. And so, you know, at Highspot, we launched our sales training product probably over a year and a half ago. And, you know, we're working to drive new product adoption with that. And, you know, that's a whole new go-to-market plan. And as mentioned before, it's kind of like these customers have to start from the beginning of the buyer's journey. You know, they knew us for like our core product content and guidance. And now, you know, we've expanded to have this sales training one. And so they know who Highspot is, but like they don't know the value of having their sales training enablement all on one system and what that can provide and how that can actually help improving their sales performance. And so I think using the data to help build out these programs to like target the specific accounts that we fit for the product and the messaging is very critical. And like the content, once again, is content and messaging is very key to this. Um, But starting over, starting from awareness again and going all the way through based off of this. So I think there's a lot of opportunity with customer marketing and like the life cycle there. And it really just starts all over again. And it could, depending on, you know, the different account firmographics and what product they're using, you could go in different directions. Yeah, I, that's actually the, the, a really, really interesting point there you talk about in terms of the full life cycle, because uh, the product level information, how they're utilizing a product or what products or services are they buying from, a, you know, from your company that you're working at, um, 
and then feeding that back into your uh, marketing initiatives. Not only will that help to refine, to find future customers, because now, you know, you're understanding how the product is being used. Um, you can start to, you know, market that, you know, in, in, in other ways to, to find new customers. But to your point, it also helps you to penetrate with existing customers, cross-sell, upsell, uh, in those opportunities. But also, I think it, it also, like you say, full circle comes back around. Now, are there referral opportunities? Are there other things that you can cycle back with your existing customers uh, that you can learn to, uh, to, to, to draw in, you know, more like customers? So I, I love how you describe that, um, you know, customized uh, customer experiences using that full life cycle of data. That's a, that's a really great description. Um, I guess the last part there in terms of the, the delivery of it, any advice uh, in terms of what has been some of the, the best learnings you've gained about how you actually deliver data-driven customer experiences to the buyer? Yeah, I think obviously there's many different formats, many different channels, you know, email, website, gifting, direct mailers, wonder one outreach. Um, but I think the important part is really making sure, you know, y your program's integrated and that you're testing all of this. You're ma you're seeing what channel's working, what messaging's working, what content's working. And I think it's definitely different at every company. Um, different channels work better depending on different personas you're targeting in different industries. So um, to me, testing is key and really part of the process of figuring, you know, what's working and what's not. Mm -hmm. uh, always great uh, advice. A number of our guests talk about the value of, of that, whether it's an A-B test or testing something. Uh, what is the result? Modify, you know, uh, feedback loop, you know, check that work, you know, revise, keep moving forward. So that's great. Um, Last comment here then would be, is there anything else that uh, we haven't talked about related to the customized customer experiences? Um, any last minute tips uh, uh, you know, that, that you can share? Yeah, I mean, I think in the sense of, you know, related customer, I think the biggest thing is more of like the brand experience, B2B, B2C, whatever you are having a consistent, cohesive brand experience across all of your channels and having, you know, messaging content consistent is, is really key. And then I think secondly is go to market alignment, you know, understanding the different pain points of your departments and really making sure that, um, you are aligning across sales, across every marketing function and everyone is kind of aligning to those company strategic goals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Excellent advice. Well, uh, before we wrap up today's episode, uh, Lauren, what is the main takeaway that you want to leave our audience with in understanding the challenges facing marketing operations executives today? Definitely. Um, I think that, as I mentioned, go to market alignment, understanding pain points and helping to like streamline and create better processes across all of those de departments. Um, I do think, you know, leaning in on your enablement team to help you drive this alignment so you can focus really on what matters most for operations, which is like data, process, and reporting. Mm, excellent. Data, process, and reporting. <laughs> there it is. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Art of Marketing Operations. Thank you so much for joining us today, Lauren. Yes, thank you for having me. Well, until next time, stay safe, take care, and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to The Art of Marketing Operations, brought to you by Taylor. Don't forget to hit subscribe in your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, review, and share. Until next time.